always loved wrestling from the time I was four years old. When um, we moved to Houston in 1969-06 and we started watching Paul Bosch's Houston wrestling. I was 22, 23 years old and I, I knew everything there was to know. What the hell is this guy that's been in the business and main evented all over the world and, and booked and created a successful business? What the hell is he going to teach me? I walked out on Bill one time and um, came back with my tail between my legs realizing that I didn't have all the answers and that they didn't come knocking on my door or Houston. Now I could go to Watts and I could go beyond that and go to Dallas and, and try to build something on a national, maybe international basis. But when Jim Crockett in, got involved in it, I, I didn't have a whole lot of faith in Jim Crockett, didn't know him that well, so I didn't, it wasn't a yay or nay. Right. But here's Vince going into Detroit drawing 93,000 people and you're looking at that going, wow, I could be a part of that. You go up to New York and they just finished up WrestleMania 3 where you know guys are getting payoffs that they would get for a month in one day. I did work with the promotions department, I did work with the booking department, I did work with the TV. And I just kind of found my way into, you know, you hear all the rumors, you hear all, all the bullshit. And, and most of it's bullshit. If you ever get take the time to, to sit down and talk to Pat Patterson, Pat Patterson without a doubt, Pat is one of those guys you can classify as a genius. Pat's one of those guys that you classify as truly one of the all-time greats this business will ever see. And that That's not saying a lot. Not just one of the greatest you ever see that will ever be in this business. He lived it. He breathed it. He was it. Understands it unlike anyone you'll ever meet. Um, Pat wants to know when you're going from A to, okay, you're going to go to A to Z. Pat's going to want to know. B, C, D, E, F, G, H, all the way through. Hulk knew where he was going. Um, top guys knew where they were going. Had an idea, the plans laid out. Some didn't. Some just showed up. Some didn't want to know. Some guys just wanted to show up and do their job and and pray they were figured in. So it, it, it would depend on the level of talent and how much time they had. When Ted Turner started offering these humongous uh, guaranteed contracts to talent that they'd never seen before. And whether you work or not, you get paid. Um, Vince had run his business on a tradition that, that had been all of our lives. Is you made what you earned. If you, the houses drew, you made money. Didn't draw, you didn't make a lot of money. And it was, I believe it was Lex Luger who actually coined the phrase talent relations. And I can't even remember what the hell we were before that. Huh. But it was a it was some kind of a dispute with JJ Dillon and and Lex went to Vince and says, What you really need is you need talent relations. You said want somebody to relate. And Vince like, That's it! God damn. Talent relations. Huh. When Ted Turner started offering these humongous uh, guaranteed contracts to talent that they'd never seen before. And whether you work or not, you get paid. Um, Vince had run his business on a tradition that, that had been all of our lives. Is you made what you earned. If you, the houses drew, you made money. Didn't draw, you didn't make a lot of money. And it was, I believe it was Lex Luger who actually coined the phrase talent relations. And I can't even remember what the hell we were before that. Huh. But it was a, it was some kind of a dispute with J.J. Dillon and and Lex went to Vince and says, what you really need is you need talent relations. You said want somebody to relate. And Vince, that's it. God damn, talent relations. Huh. Shit, where are we going to get the time from? Because tape, you can find the time. That's easy. You can edit. We were live on NBC. Thing with Dino Bravo. Dino Bravo couldn't get the... The, the weights up and it took forever and that segment went really long and you got a Royal Rumble every two minutes a new guy comes in and I'm looking at the clock and I'm going we're not going to make this like, what do you mean? I said well do the math so that segment went about eight heavy this segment went three heavy this segment went heavy I said we're out of time and uh, Dick Ebersol from uh, NBC Sports was, was sitting next to me, so he goes, all right, take the clock off the screen, and let's uh, just send the next guy. 
So we sent the next guy. And then we'd look and we'd go, okay. We, we knew where we were, what had to happen during these things. We're like, okay, once that happens, send the next guy. Send the next guy. And we came up with the term Titan time. If you're not fighting to be the champ, if you're not fighting to be the guy that everybody paid to see, then why are you in the business? Whoever was above him on a plane, that was his space. If he had the seat below, that was his space. Don't put your shit up there. Somebody put their shit up here. My shit. And he just, um, Andre could be a mean, nasty giant, but he could also be a cool as shit. <laughs> and he was, he was the boss. I mean, can you imagine going through life as a seven foot four giant? Well, it's funny because I don't think that Vince ever really saw Crockett as, quote, competition. What did they have? What did they have that Vince couldn't just take? But he went in and he offered them something for it. What did they have? They had air. That's all they had. They, there was no binding contracts or no law that said, I am the only person that can promote in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Because I was here first and I'm Vern Gagne. Bullshit. He could have taken care of his home base. And Bill always talks about, well, it was the oil crash. It was the economy. It was this. It was that. No, Bill. It was you wanted to be not the world wrestling. You wanted the universe. Okay? So you wanted to go to Chicago. You wanted to go to L.A. You wanted to go to New York. You wanted to go everywhere where you had no business going. You weren't ready to go there yet. Now, frankly, you know what? Mid-South could have gone there and done business better than the UWF did. I love the business, so I, I like to watch everything. You know, I watched uh, Dallas show, world-class show. I watched everything out of Atlanta and Crockett stuff. I'd, I'd watch uh, Don Owen stuff out of Portland. Right. Um, whatever, whatever there was, I'd watch it. Maybe have a few beers and... I would start preaching, Vince would start preaching, you say, if we ever get out of the wrestling business, we're going to get a tent, put a tent up, and make some real money. And it was it was just timing. I, I pitched the idea to Vince, and he said, great, find me somebody to do it. And I said, I can do it. He said, not with that face. And um, I showed him I could do it. I changed it, got dressed up in the stuff, did it for him, and, and he was born. Yeah, you, know you get goosebumps, they go away. You know, you get goosebumps and you feel feel it go over and they and then it, it dissipates. I remember Nassau Coliseum and Hogan came out, Hogan had been gone for a while, and it was his first time back in the New York market. It was my first time in Nassau Coliseum. Um, and it was the first time Brother Love and Hulk Hogan were ever gonna come face to face. And that son of a bitch came out and got in the ring and I got goosebumps and they just stayed. <laughs> you can do a character, you can be an on-air character, or you can be behind the scenes and be all the characters. I like to be all the characters. So I think for me I wanted to be be all the characters and I was willing to give up that, that one character so I could play with everybody. Roddy was, we went in this dressing room in Denver Coliseum and, and it was a separate dressing room and put Roddy over there and, and uh, I said, you mind if I, you know, hang on here with you? <laughs> no, son, that's okay. And, uh, and, I, and I started talking to him and I said, you know, I, I do you. And he's like, oh, that's, that's nice. You know, Roddy likes to touch and pet and things and, and um, I explained to him what I, what I wanted to do. I said, basically, I'd like to uh, interview you. Do I said, you, you've seen my stuff? He goes, yeah, I saw the little thing you do there. Yeah, it's, that's, that's cute. Yeah, yeah, you know, you're good. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, well, I'd like to do it, but what I'd like to do is each time I ask you a question, I would like to answer for you. Show me what you mean. And I, and I showed him what I meant, and I, and I would go into him, and, and I could just see the blood coming up. And, um, because I always heard Roddy really didn't like people doing imitations of him. 
It's been said that uh, one of the keys to success when working with Vince is to get him to think that your idea is something that he came up with. How true is that? <laughs> it depends. It's it's like the funny thing is 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 it's not getting him to do that. He'll he'll eventually get there. <laughs> no, but I'm sure. No, but the Fink always had ideas. He was always pitching. There were a lot of people like that. It, it wasn't. Vince is the filter. He's the one that's going to make the decision. But he's got it coming at him from, from everywhere. So it, it doesn't matter. It's like It was just me, Vince, and Pat for many years. But there was everybody throwing ideas at us.